Hello, I'm Suzanne James for Green Left, and thank you for joining us. Today we'll be speaking to the Socialist Alliance candidate for the Senate in Victoria, Angela Carr. Angela is a dedicated trade unionist, co-convener of the Geelong Housing Action Group, and a mother of three. Angela is also a community service worker who works closely with marginalised communities to address the growing inequality and social crisis we're seeing in Australia. Angela joins us from Victoria now. Angela, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Um, thanks for interviewing me. Happy to be here. I'd like to start with the number one issue that's at the top of everybody's list this election and has been for some time in the community, and that's the scarcity of an outrageous increasing cost of housing. Now, you, this is your portfolio, one of your favourite areas. And you have said on your website, and I quote, many people are no longer guaranteed housing security and they are living on grossly inadequate income support payments or low wages. Now, given that every single government scheme from first homeowners grants to rental relief system have done nothing but cause constant increases in the cost of both, mm. um, where, where do you see this? going where do you, what do you see as the main drivers of the housing crisis and how do you want to see those addressed yes yeah, so i think one of the biggest drivers is the fact that housing has become a commodity so housing is really looked at as an asset for people and so really gone are the days where you know a low income family a one parent earner could buy a house on a relatively low wage so we now have dual income families that are priced out of the housing market. And so we are seeing tax concessions for landlords that inflate prices. And I definitely agree that the first home buyer schemes, they only work to push up prices because people that have money use that extra money in the bidding wars. And obviously um, you touched mm -hmm. on it too. So wages and cost of living um, increases are also a factor in the growing housing crisis. And we've got a lot of greedy landlords that just continue to jack up prices of rent. So increasingly, many people in our community, they simply don't have enough money to actually rent in the private market. Um, and if they do, they can be spending up to 70% of their income on rent, um, leaving little left for food or, you know, school fees or things like that, just the basics. In Victoria, as an example, we have over 110,000 people on our public housing waiting list. Um, and, you know, not enough's being done to address this. So I actually used to work in the housing and homelessness sector. So I have seen firsthand the absolute desperation out there in the community. And in the regions like where I live in Geelong, more and more people become homeless every day. And there's actually been... Um, an increase of 26% of our population in the last two years. So we do have a housing shortage as well. And I think the only way out of this crisis is a large scale expansion in quality public housing. So we need a million properties across the country and we do need a federal government intervention. Um, often it's pushed off onto the states, but we need all levels of government to come together um, and implement like a Finnish style housing first type model. And we also need to provide wraparound support services to people with complex social issues. There's lots of things that can be done. We definitely need to cap private rental prices. Um, we need incomes. People should not spend more than 20% of their income on public housing. We need to stop the privatisation that's happening to the public housing sector across Australia. Um, and we need to get rid of those for-profit community housing providers because tenures are not secure and they're more expensive and they handpick the tenants that they put into those properties. So it's notoriously difficult, the area of public housing and the privatisation only makes it more complex. The level of maintenance is required and the social equity issues, it's... It's, it's, it's one thing to build all these properties, but it's difficult, isn't it, to, to fill in all those other factors that go with it. It's like a hospital bed. It has so many other things attached. Yeah, they've been allowed to run maintenance into the ground. Um, yeah, so that, that has been a major issue. But 
I mean, at Socialist Alliance, we have a lot of alternatives, obviously the large scale expansion of building housing, but we could also establish state owned bodies to provide low interest loans. Um, rich developers, they should be made to contribute 30% of their developments to public housing stock. Mm -hmm. We can implement vacant um, taxes on vacant dwellings um, and obviously raising um, people's income support above the line, above the poverty line. That's actually really critical to this issue. Another area, speaking of the poverty line and lack of affordability, another area we're interested in is affordable health care. Yeah. Now, that's getting increasingly out of reach of the taxpayers that are funding the thing and have been for generations. And with so many major workforce issues and, and so much underfunding and the fault lines have been laid bare by COVID of decades of neglect. So it's, it's, it's been so savagely cut by the LNP, everything from Medicare to public hospital co-funding between a state and a federal. How, how does Socialist Alliance intend to deal with all that? What changes would you make? And, and would you campaign to add dental to the Medicare rebate schedule? Yeah, definitely. So we know that the Liberal government's been against Medicare since its implementation in the 80s. And we did see Frydenberg assure us the other night um, on budget night that Medicare is guaranteed, but we do know that this is actually utter rubbish because last year under the guise of COVID, they actually removed 900 items from the scheme. And indeed. indeed. Yeah, and that meant out-of-pocket costs um, for surgery for life-saving surgeries I should add um, and but they've eroded things off the schedule over the last nine years so you know access to early intervention diagnostic tests have been removed and this is this is leading people to really poor and preventable health outcomes we also saw on the 1st of January this year that psychiatry via telehealth was actually removed for regional remote areas and, you know, we need to think about this in the context of these areas. People struggle to access specialist services. And then we think about, you know, people out in the bush, they've had to contend with um, bushfires and floods, the pandemic. And we know that it's never been tougher for people's mental health out in the bush. So, you know, mental health access is actually a massive issue across the country as well. Accessing a general practitioner is really difficult now. There's fewer bulk billing clinics and there's no legal obligation for doctors in non-bulk billing clinics to actually provide bulk billing to concession card holders. And so, you know, we think about the people that need to visit a doctor regularly. It's people with young children, the elderly, people with complex medical issues, people with disabilities. And, you know, generally speaking, they're the people that have, you know, not much access to disposable income. So it then puts a massive strain on our emergency departments because people have to present there because they can't access primary health care. Um, another thing that I'm not sure that everyone's really aware of, I worked in the disability sector a long time, but we don't have access to free paediatric care for our children. So... Children often um, that are the most disadvantaged from low socioeconomic families, you know, you know, we see a higher presentation of disability in that group, but it costs up to $300 to visit a paediatrician. Um, and while there is some rebated costs, it's well in excess of $140. So, you know, our poor kids, they can't even access medical treatment that they really, really need. Um, when we think about the PBS and the costs of scripts, you know, this rises every year. Um, and at the moment, the average cost of a script, if you have a healthcare card, is $6.80. But this really adds up when you have multiple scripts to fill, you know, doctor's fees, and you're on a pension that's well below the poverty line. So, you know, people are struggling to even access their medicines now. And Really, the only way out of this is to restore free universal health care. You know, we need to stop the current privatisation of the health care system and we need to boost funding for preventative care, mental health services and chronic disease management. When you talk about um, dental care, we know that free universal dental care is critically important 
because poor dental hygiene is actually a precursor for a lot of um, other chronic and debilitating health conditions like cardiovascular stroke, diabetes and things like that. So as Socialist Alliance, we definitely support free um, universal dental care. There's so many areas of inequity right now, it's hard to know where it starts or where it ends. Another one of those areas is education here. What's the Socialist Alliance stance on education? Yeah, so, I mean, this one's pretty simple. We just need to guarantee free public education across primary, secondary, tertiary and vocational education. We used to actually have free education in this country, so it's not an abstract idea. And, but what we continue to see across all service areas is including education is just that neoliberal agenda of privatisation. And we know that when a service is privatised, profits are put above people and any hope of a quality service is basically destroyed. So, you know, we need to end public funding to private schools and we need to bring public schools up to the standard of private schools to promote equality and real opportunities for kids. And it doesn't matter where they live or where they come from. You know, we have a very inequitable system at the moment. And currently we know that the government spends in excess of triple the amount per student in a private school than in a public school. And this is despite public schools having the greatest need. You know, and I just find it utterly disgraceful that we continue to live in this two-tiered system of the haves and the have-nots, you know, and it's our children that are suffering for this. We've seen um, the privatisation of tertiary education. That's been an absolute disaster. We have a plethora of um, RTOs who charge excessive amounts of money for qualifications but they're often not accredited and they're often not good enough to actually get people a job. Um, and we're seeing the privatisation of universities playing out with terrible consequences for staff and students. Uni degrees have never been more expensive and they're setting young people up for like a massive lifetime of debt. Um, and the casualisation for the university staff, it's really become a huge worker exploitation issue. You know, there's no security of tenure. You know, they work long overtime hours they're not paid for. And we've seen a lot of mass sackings over the last two years as well. I mean, the pressure is on teachers um, at all different types of education, primary and secondary. They also put in, you know, long hours without pay. Um, and in junior schools like kindergartens, we constantly hear about teachers having to pay for toys and resources out of their own pocket, you know, and we know that preschool teachers have some of the lowest wages out there, you know, it's just disgraceful. So at Socialist Alliance, we support free education, we need to expand the TAFEs, we need to abolish hex debts, and we need to end public funding of private, private um, schools. I'd like to talk now about one of your areas of expertise. You're a community service worker and you've been particularly critical of the NDIS and you're in pretty good company. There's been royal commissions, there's been inquiries, there's been a lot of criticism from across the sector, across the country. Um, as we all know, the NDIS has been pretty much cannibalised by the LNP government. Um, and as you said yourself, and I quote, will only further stress and disadvantage those with disabilities, which of course is the polar opposite of what its Labor architects intended it to do. Given all the issues with the NDIS and the country's long-term inability to address the needs of disabled people across all those areas we've talked about, education, housing, um, the provision of medical services, is it really as simple as putting it back the way Labor had it or are we at a point where you have to recognise that as a country we've failed culturally and systemically to address the needs of disabled people and it's going to take a lot more than the NDIS being put back the way it was to change that? What's your comment on that? Hmm, it's definitely a big question. So it is a complex issue after nine years of mismanagement by the Liberal government. And do I believe Labor are going to do any better? Um, in some ways, yes, but I do think we really need to keep applying the pressure 
so the Labor government do the right thing by participants in the scheme. The system does need a radical overhaul and it just requires the political will to do so. Um, you know, the honest truth is the current implementation of the scheme is just in utter crisis. Um, every day we hear about critical support funding being slashed from people's plans and people, um, you know, struggling to access the scheme despite, you know, being eligible. And, you know, last year we actually saw the NDIS spent 20, $29 million, I think it was, on lawyers to fight participants within the courts over their funding. You know, it's just disgusting. So I, I have personal experience with the scheme also, so I know how highly bureaucratic it is. Um, and someone described it to me the other day that you need a form to fill in a form. And, you know, I think that's really, that's very accurate. And it disadvantages people that have cognitive disabilities, low literacy, English as a second language. Um, you know, many people within the scheme, people that might have psychosocial disability. And many of the staff have little to no understanding of disability support needs. And the current push from the government is actually to cut people's plans. We know this, you know, there was some stuff around KPIs a while ago. And Linda Reynolds even stated herself that this is not a welfare scheme, you know, intended for life, but it's outrageous because people have come onto the scheme because it's shown that they have a permanent dis disability. Um, so you did allude to the workforce issue, and this is an issue, especially in regional and remote areas. But what we know is there could be good job creation from schemes like the NDIS, but the conditions for staff are not what they should be. You know, it's a highly casualised workforce, low paid. Back when I used to be a support worker 15 years ago or 10, 15 years ago, we were employed on permanent contracts. Um, you know, this is something that needs to be reinstated for workers. You know, they also need to have good employment conditions and that helps with the continuity of care for participants as well. There needs to be better oversight into the rorts and profiteering um, of the providers. You know, many of whom bill for services, they, you know, they never deliver. You know, so the lives of people with disability should not be for profit. You know, private for-profit organisations should not be receiving publicly funded money. So, you know, at Social Alliance, we believe that democratic governance of all disability bodies, including the NDIS, needs to be fundamentally organised by people, you know, with lived experience, with a disability. We need those people on the board. We need those people making the decisions. Um, you know, the NDIS needs to be fully transparent and accountable. People with disability and their organisations, they have to be the central decision makers here. Eligibility needs to be looked at. We need to stop applying a medical model to this. Um, you know, the scheme, I understand it's an insurance scheme and fundamentally that's probably what's, that is what's wrong with it. Yeah, it must meet people's needs. Um, you know, and that's not happening now. People with psychosocial disability, they need to be part of the scheme because the states have dropped all their funding for those people, but they struggle so terribly with access to this scheme and the NDIS bureaucrats really don't understand psychosocial disability and there's, you know, a lot of hardship for those people within the scheme. So, I mean, there's a lot, lot of work to be done on this, you know, a lot of work, but... You know, it needs to come from the ground up and people with disabilities need to have a say. Look, thank you very much for your time today, Angela. It's been great talking to you. Is there any other key policy areas you'd like to share with us? No, I no, I don't think so. Thank you for your time. But I will say that we do have, I'm in good company, so we do have 14 amazing other candidates standing across the country. Um, you know, amazing trade unionists, activists, you know, really staunch campaigners over the year, people that have been socialists on council. And up in Queensland in the seat of Leichhardt, we actually have Pat O'Shane, you know, so she's a really amazing candidate. She was the first Aboriginal um, woman appointed to be a judge. So, you know, I'm really standing in some good company, I would say.
Okay, thank you very much for your time today, Angela. Thanks for speaking with us. That was Angela Carr, Socialist Alliance candidate for the Senate in Victoria. She's also a community service worker and a mother of three children, and we wish her the best of luck with her campaign. I hope we can talk to her again soon after she wins. This is Suzanne James for Green Left. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.